Hi everyone, today we will be presenting our research titled Memory Retention Planaria After Head Regeneration Insights into Non Neural Mechanisms in Alzheimer's Disease. Hi, my name is Angelina Nguyen and I go to Lake Baddock Secondary School. And my name is Nick Dev, and I go to Oakton High School. Okay, so what inspired us to actually do this research is actually my grandma. So three years back, my grandma was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And at first, I really didn't really think it was a big deal just because I thought forgetting was a part of her old age and how everyone forgets things sometimes. But my grandma, she wasn't really just my grandma. She was more like my other half. She basically took care of me as I grew up due to my parents' busy schedule, and she was always at our house. She always made me food, told me stories, and made me feel safe. Every morning, we'd walk to shoppers together to get baked goods, and it was like our little routine. She'd get the same croissant every time, and she'd tell me stories or lecture me on the way there. But then, one day, she couldn't really walk up the hill anymore. And I thought it was just her body slowing down, but I didn't realize this was a sign of how serious things were getting. After that, she started showing signs of memory loss, like birthdays, little moments, even our daily routine. That's when I really started to realize that it wasn't just age. It was her memory slowly slipping away. Now... I barely get to see her, and when I do, sometimes she remembers me, and sometimes she doesn't. It's honestly the worst feeling because this is the same person who used to know everything about me, who raised me, and who made who I am today. It's heartbreaking to watch her personality and soul slip away, and it feels like there's nothing left but a shell. I truly miss how she used to be, especially her voice, her laugh, and really everything. But I've learned that even if she forgets me one day, I'll never forget her. Okay, so on this slide, you can see an image of a regen planarian. Their regenerative ability comes from these incredible pluripotent stem cells called neoblasts, which make up about a third of their body. These cells can transform into, into any other cell type, anything you can think of, like neurons, muscles, anything. So when a planarian is cut, the neoblasts move to the wound site and rebuild whatever is missing. They follow a precise internal map of the body plan, guided by genetic signaling like WNT and BMP and by ele bioelectric gradients. Those Wolgers patterns you see in the diagram that help the tissue know where they were to form the head versus the tail. In about two weeks, a completely new brain is formed and fully functional. And as shown here, some experiments suggest that even though it's a new brain, the regenerative planarium might still remember what they've learned before. This slide right here compares planaria to Alzheimer's disease. In the brain scans and neuron images here, you can see how Alzheimer's damages brain tissue, amyloid beta plaques and tau tangles build up and destroy synapses, leading to neuron loss and irreversible memory decline. Humans have limited regenerative capacity, mostly small amounts of neurogenesis in the hippocampus, but that declines with age and is nearly shut down in Alzheimer's. In contrast, planaria can rebuild their entire central nervous system from scratch. So, if they can also preserve memory, it means something about how their body encodes information goes beyond neurons, maybe through molecular epigenetic or bioelectric memory systems that could inspire future treatments. So, our research question. Can planaria... Retain learned information after their head and therefore their brain is completely removed and regenerated? On this slide, you can see the molecular diagram representing epigenetic control, the DNA coil, and chemical decks. 
Epigenetic mechanisms like DNA methylation and histone acetylation control which genes are active without changing the DNA sequence. When organisms learn something new, these modifications stabilize the change in gene expression linked to that learning, basically writing memory into the molecular level. In Alzheimer's, the system breaks down. An enzyme called AD. AC2 becomes overactive and silences genes that support learning and plasticity. Blocking ADAC2 can actually restore memory function in experimental models. So, if planaria can retain memory after regenerating their head, it might be because those same epigenetic patterns persist in the neoblast when the new brain grows. It uses that molecular information to reconstruct the same memory related gene networks. So this slide connects what we've learned from planaria to Alzheimer's research. In humans, there's been a lot of work done using stem cell transplant and neuron progenitor therapy to try to replace neurons lost in Alzheimer's. These approaches can produce new neurons and the stem cells can release protective factors like BDNF and GDNF, which support surviving neurons. But the biggest challenge is integration. How to make new neurons connect properly to rebuild memory networks. Planaria do this naturally. After regeneration, their new neurons integrate perfectly, restoring the same behaviors they had before. Th that suggests that there are built-in biological signals, possibly molecular, epigenetic, or bioelectric, that tell the new brain how to reconnect. If we can understand those signals, they could guide human neurons to rebuild damaged circuits more effectively. So here on this slide, you can see the classic experiment image, planaria trained with food, which in this case is beef liver as the conditioning reward. In the 1950s and 60s, James and Connell ran these kind of studies. He trained planaria to respond to light or vibration paired with food. After cutting and regenerating them, the worms seem to remember the conditioning. He even hypothesized that memory could be chemically transferred, possibly through RNA, a controversial but groundbreaking idea at the time. Then, decades later, Shamrat and Levin revisited the question using modern methods. They conditioned planaria to associate light with food and after head removal and regeneration. The same planaria relearned the association faster than new ones. That's what you see represented on the slide. The planarian moving towards the light and the beef showing that some kind of learned response persisted even after the brain was regenerated. And this shows a few of the most fascinating examples of non neural memory, including the caterpillar experiment you see here. In 2008, Blackie Stone trained. Manduka sexa caterpillars to associate a particular odor with a mild shock. After they went through metamorphosis and became moths, which involved complete restructuring of their nervous system, the adult moths still avoided that odor. That means the memory survived total neural recognition. Then, in 2018, Betty Carrots did something similar with sea snails. They trained the snails with electric shocks, extracted RNA from the trained animals, and injected it into untrained ones. The untrained snails began reacting the same way, showing a sensitized reflex even though they'd never been trained themselves. That's the study that reintroduced the idea of memory RNA. The RNA mo mo molecules themselves can carry information about experiences by changing gene expression. So. When we think about planaria, it's possible that RNA in their neoblasts encodes some kind of memory signature that new neurons later use during brain regeneration. So that leads us to our experiment. So starting with our planarian subjects, we use freshwater planaria, and they're maintained in clean spring water and fed organic beef liver twice a week. And before training, we starve them five days for five days. And the interesting thing is, is to get our freshwater, like our fresh water for the planaria, they actually needed very clean water and 
quite frequent frequent water changes as well. So what we had done is we went to our local fish store and we got some RODI water to maintain the planaria. So as you can see on the video on the left over here, as the light, this is before training, as light is shined onto the planaria, they have quite a big response and they start moving pretty erratically. And this over here shows our kind of training process without the light. And as you can see that the planaria feel quite comfortable going towards the beef liver and they're all eating it and are pretty happy. So what was our training protocol? So we allow them 10 days of conditioning. So essentially what we were testing them for, and we would put our beef liver on the light side, like this video over here. And the worms were allowed 15 minutes to go find and consume the food. And sometimes the worms didn't want to go and explore because they were too scared of the light. So we would occasionally tap the side to encourage exploration. And by the end, the worms move pretty easily into the lit area as seen over there. Next was our surgery and regeneration. So we actually decapitated them with an X-Acto knife. And that's seen over here with our tail fragment and our head fragment. And then the tail fragment was allowed 14 days to get regenerated. And during that time, we made sure that we didn't feed like the tail section or the head section, because later on, we compare the head with the tail to see if they were having around the same learning. And the reason why we didn't feed them over this period of time was to make sure that they didn't have any new learning during this time. And by day 14, there's a completely new head and brain regenerated. And also we made sure to maintain them in a low light neutral setting with no training exposure. We kept them in our basement with the lights completely off with no access to beef liver and pretty much an untrained environment. And these are more photos on the right of us decapitating the planaria. So here were our findings and our data points. On this test over here, this was before any testing had occurred. We tested how many worms were on the light side versus the dark side every two minutes. And as you can see here by the black line, the planaria before training completely preferred the dark side by a massive amount. And this was our graph after training. As you can see, the graph's pretty much totally inverted. Now the planaria actually prefer the light side over the dark side and spend most of their time on the light side. And the reason for this was because of the training and they associated light with food. So now they felt more comfortable moving onto that side. And finally, this shows our comparison between our original brain and our regenerated brain. And we gave 10 different worms, worm ID'd one through 10, and we kept their head on one Petri dish and then their tail on another. And we would compare the two and see if they had similar behavior uh, pre-regeneration in training and post-regeneration and see if they still remember that training. And this scatter plot over here kind of shows that. And as you can tell, all the regenerated brains either spent around the same time as the original brain or even spent more time. And what that tells us is that even after regeneration, the planaria still actually prefer the light side and still remember their training, which was quite interesting. So that wraps up our research, but in conclusion, we are connecting Alzheimer's memory, so dementia, to planaria because they are able to regenerate. And our hypothesis is that if planaria can regenerate after being cut off, then maybe there is a way in humans where you can also regenerate memory the same way that planarians do. All right. Thank you and so much. We just want to say thank you to Dr. Levin for giving us this opportunity to speak on the channel, and we're very appreciative. Thank you. Thank you.